Good evening and welcome to Dome at Home, the Manitoba Museum's Planetarium Weekly Astronomy Show. I'm your host, Scott Young, Planetarium Astronomer at the Manitoba Museum, and it is great to be back for another episode of Dome at Home. Now, normally, I do this show from the Dome at Home studio, which is in an undisclosed basement location, um, my house. But uh, today, things are a little bit different. We had some things come up, and so this is actually a recorded show that I recorded this morning at 11 a.m. So that means I'm not going to be as directly interactive with all of you as I would normally be, at least with my voice. However, even though I can't be in the Dome at Home studio right now, I am able to be in the chat. And so here I am saying hello to you in the chat. So hopefully uh, I'm there on video and I'm there live in the chat. So we can still sort of make this work. And uh, I think things will be back to, to normal for next week. All right, let us get started with uh, what is a packed show. We have a whole bunch of things that are either going on right now or about to go on. The sky is full of all sorts of uh, great events. We also have some very interesting weather forecast again for Southern Manitoba. For those of you that haven't heard, we're, uh, we're expecting another band of snow to come in. So hopefully, Either that will miss or it will end, and then the skies will clear and we'll get a good chance to see some of these cool things. So let's jump right into uh, some of the things that we have coming up. Our Dome at Home Astronomy courses have been going great guns. It was great to see so many of you um, last, uh, last couple of days, I guess, on Tuesday at the Observing the Moon course, one of our intermediate level courses for people that have tel telescopes or binoculars. It's, uh, these courses are great because you get to turn your cameras on too. And so I actually get to meet a whole bunch of you sort of face to face that, uh, you know, so far I've only seen you in the chat window. So it was really nice to see a bunch of you. And uh, that was a fun course. We talked about how to observe the moon and all the things that are going on, uh, what kind of equipment you use and all those, those sorts of things. We have another one coming up, the last one of the season. And there we go, uh, observing the deep sky. The deep sky is the term that astronomers use, amateur astronomers mostly, for anything beyond the solar system. So I mean the moon, the planets, the sun, that's all the solar system. Everything else is the deep sky. And it kind of requires a different approach to the way you observe. Sometimes it requires some different equipment. Not always. I mean, some people have a bunch of different telescopes, but you can, you can use whatever gear that you have to observe deep sky objects, galaxies and star clusters and nebula and things like that. And we'll talk about how to uh, get the most out of, out of uh, your equipment and how to get good views and how to record some of the things that you see. So that's coming up Tuesday, May the 4th. That's our last course for the spring. We'll be uh, coming back in the fall to rerun some of the courses for anybody that missed it. There are a couple of people that missed the Observing the Moon course, and so I will be scheduling a makeup time for that. I haven't got to it yet, unfortunately, though, but it will be sometime in May. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure that anybody that missed that or anybody that wants to sign up for it and, uh, and join us, we'll, we'll have a, another session of the Observing the Moon. The moon's always up, so it's sort of always a relevant course. We got some great viewer images sent in. Um, this one comes from, uh, from Rudy and Andy, and Last, uh, last week, I said that, there, that it was Rudy and Andy, Ruby and Andy Mantech, because that's what their email was, was set up there. Um, that's not their last name at all. So it's, it's uh, takeouts. And uh, anyway, they have been watching the sky. Last week, they saw the four planets all lined up in their image. And here we have planet number five, the planet Mercury. So well done. Um, Andy was uh, one of the first ones to send in observations of Mercury, actually the day after we issued that challenge last week. So well done. Uh, I know it is kind of hard to see. It looks like you've got a nice uh, low horizon, so you've got a pretty good advantage on, uh, on tracking it down. And uh, I love these sunset pictures. I mean, you get those beautiful colors of the sky, uh, and then just, a, you know, Mercury doesn't look like much because it's just a little dot in this picture, but it really gives that sense of distance and scale and just beautiful color. So I, I love this shot. Thank you. Thanks for uh, letting us show it. We also got some shots from Ulrich, who has been uh, gracing us with her images for a long time. 
Here we have the full moon rising. What a beautiful shot with the trees in front there. The moon just looks big and red and massive. It, it is a lovely picture. And you can really see how the image gets distorted when something is that close to the horizon. You're looking through a whole bunch of atmosphere and all the layers of the atmosphere bend the light around and make everything sort of go all wonky. And so you can see that the moon looks all bubbly on the edge. That's not real, that's from the atmospheric view. And even when it rises just a little bit higher, some of that starts to reduce and it starts to look a little bit more naturally round. By the time it gets up overhead, that effect is minimal and, and nobody notices it. But when it's rising, just beautiful shots. So well done, Ulrich. Um, your photography is fantastic. So thank you for sharing those. Um, one of uh, Another one of our viewers, uh, Sylvia Claussen, sent in an image that is not her own image, but a really cool one. Um, she found this story online about uh, a woman by the name of Cecilia Payne, who basically discovered what the universe is made of. And nobody's ever heard of her. I mean, you would think that uh, figuring out what the universe is made out of is a pretty big deal. But back in the day when this was happening, um, women didn't get the same kind of opportunities in terms of publishing, in terms of getting credit and things like that. So I'm not going to do the whole story here. Um, so I do encourage you to take a look at Cecilia Payne. I posted a link to her uh, sort of biography on my Scott the Sky Watcher page. So if you drop by there on Facebook, you'll be able to uh, link right to it. But if you Google her, there's a, a bunch of great stories and it really is a wonderful story. Thanks, Sylvia, for bringing that to my attention. I, uh, I hadn't heard of the, I had heard the name because she has, uh, she's sort of the basis of much of the work on variable stars, which is one of my research interests. And basically she wrote the book on it and then everybody wrote books based on her book. And so I kind of knew that connection, just the name, but not really all of the other stuff that she did. So really great story. Let's get into the sky. If you have been uh, watching the sky, we still have planets dancing in the morning sky. And every day they shift position as each one of them is at a different distance from us. Each one of them is orbiting the sun at a different speed. And basically there's this whole sort of interplay in the morning sky. Venus, bright, easy to see. Um, even when the sky is pretty bright, Venus will be the last star you see basically before the daylight begins. To their upper right, Mars and Venus, much, much fainter. To be honest, I have a, a hard time seeing them unless I go out really, really early when everything is down lower, it hasn't risen as high, but the sky is, is a little bit darker. You might want to go out early to try and find that perfect balance between um, these objects rising high enough to become visible and the sky not being so bright that you can't see them. If you do go out late though, um, Jupiter is not quite, but almost as bright as Venus. I mean, Venus is still much, much brighter, but Jupiter is, is pretty bright and it is starting to get high enough now that it's cutting through the, uh, the twilight glow. So getting out there, you notice our, our fist on the side there, your fist out at arm's length is uh, 10 degrees in altitude. So these things are all fairly low in the, uh, southeastern and eastern sky. When you get up early, you've got your day to go, and then you can stay out and take a look at Mercury in the evening on the other side of the sky. Over in the northwest, almost kitty corner um, directly opposite, Mercury is there in the sunlight, in the sunset colors. And um, above it, is the Pleiades star cluster. We've talked about the Pleiades before, the Seven Sisters, the um, beautiful little dipper-shaped star cluster. Those are moving down towards the horizon each day, as all of the stars in the sky basically are, and Mercury is kind of moving up and then looping back around. So for a while, the two of them will approach each other night after night, and they'll actually get really, really close and pass each other. So. We've got morning planets and we've got evening planets. And so as we step through this week, there is a lot of stuff to look at. Here's the morning of the 23rd. Again, Jupiter and Venus bright, Mars and Saturn not so much. The night of the 23rd, there's Mercury, slowly approaching the Pleiades star cluster. The difference between one night and the very next night, 
not a big deal, but if you go out, say, three or four days later, it definitely makes a change, and you'll notice the difference. Jupiter and Venus in the morning are pulling closer and closer together. Mars and Saturn are kind of staying, it looks like they're staying constant. I mean, they're not really, but they're, they, the, no, the motion isn't as noticeable. There's Mercury on the evening of the 24th, and basically we can, every morning and every night this week, we have a different view. Coming up on the morning of the 25th, the thin crescent moon joins the planets to make a really beautiful scene. I think this will be the best night to get shots of uh, the sky because the moon is still relatively high in the sky. The next night it does get over closer, but it also gets lower. So unless you have a really flat horizon or you can go somewhere where you've got a perfectly flat view to the southeast, um, you might be shooting through trees or whatever. However, as we saw with Ulrich's shot, you know, shooting through trees can be very, very dramatic anyway. So take a look no matter where you happen to be. There's the evening of the 25th, Mercury and the Pleiades slowly drawing closer together. Here we have the morning of the 26th, the really thin crescent moon down below all the planets there. The evening of the 26th, Pleiades and Mercury are really starting to get uh, pretty close together. Round about the 25th, 26th, you'll be able to easily put them into the field of view of your binoculars, both together. And in fact, when the sky is fairly bright, you might need binoculars to be able to easily spot Mercury. I mean, it is visible to the unaided eye, but that assumes you kind of know where to look and your eyes are already focused on the stars. And in the, in the twilight, there aren't really any stars to focus on yet. So often I find I use my binoculars that extra aid just helps me spot where they are, and then I can take the binoculars down and look in the same spot, and, and uh, my eye will be able to, to track them down. So often I spot them in binoculars first, and that's a great way to do that. The morning of the 27th, I don't think the most people will see the moon that night. It would be a beautiful triangle with Jupiter and Venus, but I think it's just going to be too low in the bright sky. But Stellarium here does show where it will be, and you can try for it. Uh, it's amazing what photographs can sometimes bring out, even if the eye doesn't see it. By taking a bunch of different exposures, you might just uh, just get lucky. And here, as we get towards the end of April, we're coming up to um, the Pleiades and Mercury nice and close together. Here's the 28th in the morning, and I'm just going to show a couple more days of the morning because Jupiter and Venus are coming towards a really close conjunction. You might remember last December when uh, Jupiter and Saturn were right next to each other in the evening sky. Well, this is kind of that kind of uh, conjunction. Oh, we had another Mercury one there. Sorry about that. Here we are on the 29th. They're well within um, b the binocular field of view uh, at this point. And in fact, uh, a really wide field telescope might show both of them on the 29th. On the on the evening of the 29th, Mercury and the Pleiades star cluster pass each other. That'll be a nice night. And then, you know, we wind up with the morning of April 30th, Jupiter and Venus right next to each other. Two, the two brightest objects in the sky other than the moon right next to each other. It's going to be a beautiful sight. I'm going to try and be up early and uh, catch some pictures. Uh, if the conditions are good enough, I'll live stream but if that doesn't work, I'll get the pictures up uh, soon thereafter, because that's really going to be a, a nice sight, sort of the culmination of this planetary dance we've been watching every morning. And then that evening, we've got Mercury and, uh, and the Pleiades. And that gives us a really, really active couple of weeks for looking at the sky. We really don't want to have any clouds at all in the last half of April. Now... I, I couldn't really even say that with a straight face because here in Manitoba, April showers bring May flowers, supposedly. Well, a April snow brings, I don't know what it brings, hopefully not floods, but uh, the weather doesn't always cooperate. That's good, though. I find when there's something in the early morning and I think it's going to be clear for a long time, it's easier to convince myself when that alarm goes up, oh, maybe I'll just stay in bed and I'll look for it tomorrow. If you don't think it's going to be clear very often, though, that maybe will give you a little bit more motivation to get out of bed and catch it when you can 
if the sky does happen to be clear to get up early and get out there because uh, we may only get one or two chances to see this wonderful planetary dance going on. All right, so that gives us um, the things that are up in the sky. And uh, next month, we'll be uh, doing a preview of the May sky, and we're going to go through all the constellations, where they are, and all that kind of stuff. So we didn't really do much on it this time because we had so much planetary things going on. Next week, we'll be doing sort of a recap of where all the constellations are and how you can find stuff. You can always find that information, of course, on the Manitoba Museum's website, uh, manitobamuseum.ca. You just click through to the planetarium section, and there's a current night sky information where we've got star charts and information and all that kind of stuff. Now today, our, our future theme is Earth Day from space, because coming up on the 22nd, tomorrow, is Earth Day. And Earth Day started in the 70s, and it was basically um, a day to celebrate the planet Earth and to sort of think about environmentalism and sustainability and things like that. And it's become quite an important day for a lot of people. And uh, the museum is doing three days of Earth Day activities starting uh, Friday at the museum, the planetarium and the science gallery. There's all sorts of stuff going on. The planetarium has brought back a show that we haven't run for a long time. It's called Ice Worlds. It's all about the climate and the ice that exists not only here on Earth, but also on many other worlds in our solar system. So kind of looking at the solar system with a particular lens. Um, there are some green energy experiments going on in the science gallery. There's special tours up in the museum and special video programs and things like that, a scavenger hunt, all sorts of really cool stuff. So you can visit the museum's um, website for all the details and the show times and things like that. But uh, that's coming up. When we were, when we were planning that program, it, it sort of got me thinking, you know, Earth Day really depends on space. I mean, a lot of our awareness of the Earth as a planet dates back to this picture. This is the famous Earthrise picture. It is um, apparently the most published photograph in history. Um, and it's taken by one of the Apollo astronauts uh, on Apollo 8 in 1968 as they were orbiting around the moon. And this was uh, also broadcast live over TV back to Earth. And it was on Christmas Eve. So it was a very kind of magical time and lots of people were watching first humans ever around the moon and we all got to see, well, I didn't, I was not born, but humans got to see their planet surrounded by space. And you, you can't even see the atmosphere. I mean, you see some clouds, but it's not like the atmosphere sticks out really, really far. It's just this tiny little thin skin that protects us from space. And I mean, I think in the 60s and even before, people were talking about the environment and sustainability and things like that. But this image gave people sort of a focus point. And uh, I think it was really sort of key in, in kickstarting some of the activity that we had. Then in the late 70s, early 80s, I think it was, this picture was taken. This was taken by the space probe Voyager 2. Um, Carl Sagan and a few other scientists sort of suggested, hey, why don't we turn the spacecraft back to Earth and take a picture of the Earth? And this became known as the pale blue dot picture because that is Earth from the distance of, I think, Saturn. So a tiny speck in the vastness of space, nothing else around us. Uh, another thing that sort of made us um, appreciate the Earth a little bit more. But it goes way beyond that now, of course. I mean, modern technology is how we know about our climate, about our environment, uh, about what's going on, and how we can learn the kinds of things that uh, we can do to improve things. You know, we, we worry about climate change. We worry about rising ocean levels. We worry about um, the disappearing uh, sea ice around the uh, Arctic regions and the effects that that's having. All that information gets tracked through space technology and satellites and things like that. So, for example, here's, uh, here's the ice uh, pack around the North Pole last, uh, last winter, and we sort of see how it grows and, and what areas are still open and so on. Every year, there's less ice based on climate change. And we know that because there's a satellite that can watch for it. We don't have to send people out there 
and measure and, you know, you'd never get complete information. But here you basically get the whole view thanks to a satellite that is, that is tracking it. So it makes it much more um, comprehensive, the data we have. And in science, the more data you have, the better the decisions you're going to make. And so that is, uh, that is a really important part of things. We also have things that can track stuff that otherwise we would never see. For example, there was a, a, a volcano that exploded in, in the Tonga region, way out in the middle of the ocean. Nobody around, basically, to, to take images or things like that. But the satellites caught it, and they were able to see the, the big plume that was... Uh, you know, able to correlate with the, the um, seismographs and, and things like that to issue su tsunami warnings and all sorts of things. So this is, again, information that we wouldn't have without that space technology that is being uh, used to, uh, to track the Earth. We actually have more spacecraft observing the Earth than we have observing any other planets, even if you counted all the Mars rovers that failed and... and uh, all the spacecraft that didn't make it and all throughout history, the Earth is still the most studied object from space. And we're still launching more spacecraft. There are, there are a couple of uh, Earth observation spacecraft that were launched just this year that are, you know, brand new technology to study specific things, to, to track, for example, the, the greenhouse gases in the, um, in the atmosphere or the amount of water vapor or vegetation or things like that. There's just so much technology that is now available, creating, uh, creating da data that is now available to scientists to improve our understanding of the planet. Because let's face it, I mean, we've only been paying attention to the planet scientifically for a few hundred years. And sort of anecdotally, you know, there are stories of, of uh, and oral traditions that have come down from, you know, a few, several thousand years, but that's still a fraction of the Earth's time that it's been here. And so we really don't have all the data. So this technology allows us to at least make sure that the data that we have is very accurate, very precise, and very comprehensive so that we can make the best uh, decisions that we can. And it's not just tracking the environment. I mean, here we're, we are seeing all the ships that are sitting out there waiting to be unloaded in a, in a harbor town. Um, understanding how many ships are going across the ocean helps us understand, you know, carbon footprints and, and things like that. I, when I saw pictures like this, I started, you know, trying to use those mail order shopping kinds of things a little bit less. I mean, I, I, I've always tried to buy our vegetables locally um, because I, do I really need, you know, carrots that are shipped from California on a truck that is polluting the atmosphere? I can get them down the street. Obviously, I don't get local pineapples or local bananas, but you, you do what you can. The more we see images like this, I think it really does filter into our behavior and, and change the way that we look at uh, what's out there and what we can do. Some of the pictures also are just beautiful. I mean, this is a picture of some uh, vortices in the ocean. And basically, it I'm sure it tells ocean scientists a whole lot of detail on where sediment is moving to and how the currents are changing and stuff like that. But to me, like I would print this and put it on my wall. It's just a beautiful, beautiful image. So just like in astronomy, the scientists get the science out of the images, and um, but everybody can appreciate the beauty. The same thing from these satellite images. And they're all available online. They're all free. I mean, you can literally download everything from these beautifully finished uh, images to the raw data. If you want to download, you know, the five pictures that were combined to put this together and do your own color selection and, and uh, balance different things yourself, you can do all of that. It's, it's pretty cool. And this isn't just global stuff. This is also local. Like here we are in Manitoba, in Treaty 1 territory. Here's Lake Winnipeg. And I mean, the satellite images that track Lake Winnipeg are one of the things that really keyed us into the idea of how at risk the lake is. It's a very big but very shallow lake. It's got uh, some drainage uh, basins that don't connect very well. There's big algae blooms every once in a while. You get the, you know, I mean, if you can see a bloom of algae from space, that tells you there's some big stuff happening. What's that algae eating? What's causing that? You know, all of those kinds of things. So, um, the satellite technology is 
helping us understand our, our own local environment. This is, a, this is a, another beautiful shot. It kind of looks like northern lights. But then I realized what it was. This is, a, this is an image of the north drainage basin of Lake Winnipeg. And the green stuff is algae. And the really bright white stuff is sediment. The, the water is eroding the shoreline and sweeping all the little particles off to the, the channel that flows all the way down uh, up, up north down to the Hudson Bay. Um, it's still beautiful, but there, it really tells us some of the challenges that the lake um, faces. That sediment can, you know, block the channel. Look how, look how narrow it gets here, right around this little island and so on. Um, and all the water is, uh, is going through that area. So um, I know it's a problem for, you know, Manitoba Hydro has to deal with the sediment and it can bung up, bung up all the hydro generators and things like that. The people that live there, um, if there are, you know, additional flooding or if there is, um, you know, an algae bloom that affects the, the health of the lake, that, that's very important. So satellite technology is, uh, is key to all of this. And Canada is a member of that. I mean, this isn't all NASA or the United States uh, European Agency or anything like that. Canada has one of the premier Earth sensing satellites in the world. Uh, the first one, RadarSat, was uh, very famous. In fact, it was it was such a good satellite. It uses radar to image the the, the surface of the Earth, uh, which means it can see through clouds and stuff like that. And when it was launched. The Americans didn't want us to release the data to people because it could be used to spy on them, essentially, because it was so good that it would be able to reveal military details and stuff like that. Um, and when we built the second uh, set of um, radar sat two went up, uh, the Americans refused to launch it on an American rocket for the same reason. Um, and so now radar sat constellation, three satellites that can cover the globe, and uh, this is a big part of Canada's space uh, industry. So seeing things like uh, tracking oil spills uh, up in the Arctic where maybe you don't see, um, you don't have a lot of people able to sort of visually see it or airplanes aren't going over, but you can see it uh, with radar sat. This is one of the pictures that really um, bothers me. This is a, this just recently, if you know uh, anybody out in the Pacific Northwest, this is around Seattle. And um, this is the temperature difference from average last summer. They had, a, they had a huge heat wave there and it was just super, super hot. And there aren't a whole lot of weather stations around on the earth anymore. I mean, in Environment Canada and the United States Weather Service it costs money to have a weather office in every little town where someone writes down the temperature and stuff like that. So the satellites really provide the key data for all of that. So again, um, understanding climate change and being able to plan for climate change is all based on these, uh, these satellite images. You get um, detection of forest fires. There are some fires burning uh, over by Lake Manitoba. Um, and, and again, the, the uh, Lake Winnipeg there, you can see there's ice on the, on the North Basin. The picture on the right uh, shows a whole bunch of the sediment that's starting to move around. That's, uh, that's about a month later. So you can see the changes over time. They also have this wonderful, um, basically it's the picture of the day kind of thing where someone takes a a great image that is just beautiful. This is a, a showing a bunch of river uh, channels in Australia, but they, and they color coded it to be able to reveal sediment and the water flow and the vegetation on the earth and deforestation and all those kinds of things, but it's just beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm gonna print this one out and stick it on the wall because it's just really amazing. So it's not just cameras pointing up that give us these beautiful scenes of nature, it's cameras pointing down and uh, that's one of the things that Earth Day is all about. So I hope you take the opportunity to celebrate Earth Day a little bit and get some sense of what, uh, what your planet has to offer. Because let's face it, it's where you live. It's where you keep all your stuff. It's probably where you spend most of your time. And uh, it's certainly worth understanding and protecting. Okay. It is now time 
for cool space stuff. There's so much cool space stuff, I couldn't get to all of it. There's just so much going on. So the sun is active. There are some big, giant sunspots that have appeared on the sun. The, the sun is rotating from left to right, and it takes about 27 days to rotate all the way around. So we have these this trio of sunspots, and there's more coming. The sun has been very, very active. Those sunspots sort of are a sign of activity. Now, you can't look at the sun unless you have a special solar filter, but there's piles of websites that show the live view of the sun or the, or the most recent view, so you can check them out there. There's also um, these, oops, it didn't, uh, oh, it didn't animate, that's too bad. There's an animation, basically there was a solar flare that occurred from that region, a big blast of material that sort of um, came flying out from the sun and uh, it was interfering with radio communication here on the earth and all sorts of uh, things like that. So if you go to a, a website like space, uh, spaceweatherlive.com, they give you the alerts for all the things happening on the sun and there's going to be more of that. That may translate into more northern lights visible for us. So that's another positive of, uh, of the solar activity. Ingenuity on Mars, little helicopter, Ginny as we call her, completed her 25th flight and is celebrating her 12th, 12 month anniversary, basically the one year uh, of being deployed and flying around on Mars. It was only supposed to work once and go up and go down just to make sure that it would work. And it's gone well beyond that. So this is a great example of, you know, human ingenuity, being able to design something that flies around on another planet and works really, really well. This will change Martian exploration and probably the exploration of other planets as well. I will be surprised if every mission from this point on doesn't include some kind of flying drone like this because it's been so successful. The space station is getting pretty crowded. Right now there are 11 people up on that thing. We don't have any good passes of the space station till about April 25th here in southern Manitoba, but you can uh, you can go online and, and figure out where they... Uh, where they're visible from your location. There's uh, the regular crew, and then there are four tourists from the SpaceX uh, Axiom-1 mission, and basically they're up there doing their own set of experiments. They're basically just sort of, it's almost like the space station is like an Airbnb where they just sort of rented space and, and they're doing their own thing and then coming back. They were supposed to come back earlier, but unfortunately uh, there were some weather delays and so they're stuck up there for a couple of extra days. Gee, that's too bad, hey? Um, well, they paid $55 million a piece to, uh, you know, get up there. So uh, I don't begrudge them an extra couple of days. Once they come back, the new replacement crew for the space station goes up. Crew 4 uh, launches on the Dragon spacecraft Freedom. And that's supposed to happen next week sometime. It was supposed to happen this week, but uh, everything's been delayed by that weather. So they'll be going up, and then after some handoff, four of the old space station crew will be coming back to Earth, and uh, we'll have, uh, again, just seven back up on the space station. Okay, this one's really cool. This is a picture of the planet Uranus, or Uranus, Uranus, the most unfortunately named planet in our solar system. It's also the least explored in many ways. The only close-up pictures we have came from the Voyager 2 spacecraft, which flew past it on its way to Neptune in 1986. And so literally, it zoomed by at like 20,000 kilometers an hour and took as many pictures as it could as it was zooming by. And that was it. We haven't been back since. Uranus, and I, I think it's probably because Uranus looks kind of bland. I mean, there's no great red spot. There's no big rings or things like that. There actually is a lot of cool stuff about this planet, it just doesn't jump out at you. And so when planning for the next 10 years of what missions should be going, there were a bunch of proposals and the mission to Uranus came up on top. So this is one of the uh, upcoming missions that will go into the planning stage. Now, it doesn't mean we're going yet, uh, but it's likely that this will at least get to the point where we'll get some, some firm plans in place. Another mission that was uh, given that kind of sort of green light to proceed is a mission to land on Saturn's moon Enceladus, which is largely made of ice. And so one of the potential places where there's liquid water and therefore perhaps 
the potential for life. There are a couple of other ones that are sort of waiting in the wings, going out to uh, Mercury, um, going to Venus and landing on Venus again for the first time in 40 years, and also visiting Europa, the moon of Jupiter, which is again an ice moon and a potential place for harboring life. And finally, the Artemis mission, the big moon rocket, they brought it out, they were going to test it all up, tank it all up with all the fuel and stuff like that, do a bunch of tests. None of the tests worked. I mean, some they partially worked, but there were a bunch of problems, not so much with the rocket, but actually with the platform that it sits on. This is the same platform that they basically have used for the Apollo moon rockets and then the space shuttle. Um, and it basically had trouble transferring the fuel to the rocket. So kind of sidelined or uh, blindsided, pardon me, the, the NASA folks. They weren't expecting that because that's, that's just always worked. And it's very, very simple, but they were having problems with it. So unfortunately, they didn't, did not get the full test through. They're going to roll it back to the big vehicle assembly building next week sometime without those tests completed. Hard to say whether they're going to do another set of tests later or if they're just going to still try and, and launch the, uh, the uncrewed mission this summer. I suspect it'll probably delay things. And of course, if Artemis 1 gets delayed, that means Artemis 2, which will carry uh, four astronauts, including a Canadian, around the moon, Artemis 2 will also get delayed. So anyway, we'll have to see what happens, but uh, as is common with these kind of really complicated missions, we've got a few delays. That brings us to the end of this show. Um, hopefully it wasn't too weird without me being able to respond verbally to the chats, but uh, I hope future me is actually doing a good job on the chat there and uh, answering your questions. If for whatever reason some questions go unanswered, I will check in late tonight and make sure that I answer any questions in the Facebook or in the YouTube chat. So thank you for joining us again. Um, next week, as I mentioned, we'll be highlighting the May sky We'll be looking at all the constellations, the planetary conjunctions, um, and things like that. And we'll be looking ahead to May's total lunar eclipse, which occurs on the night of May the 15th. So that's going to be an exciting event. We're going to be doing some live events for that, but uh, we'll touch on it briefly as part of our May highlight. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us, and uh, we will be back again next week. You can always catch us uh, at the museum at uh, Dome, uh, Manitoba Museum slash Dome at Home. And you can also always hit us up through email, Facebook, or YouTube. We try and get to all of our messages. Thanks again, and have a great evening. I hope we get some clear skies, and we'll see you all next week. Good night. <laughs>